Hi, my name is Nathan Nalla and I'm the founder and director of Be The Riot, supporting organisations to create inclusive workplace culture. One piece of the work that we do focuses on supporting organisations to develop equity, diversity and inclusion strategy. And the other side is about supplying organisations um, with learning content to support uh, the learning, the knowledge, the understanding within their workforce. And so this interactive seminar will focus on how to foster safe spaces for learning about equity, diversity and inclusion, or EDI for short, but also tips for creating safe spaces for learning in general. I'm sure many of you have come across the term safe spaces within the past few years. Some of you have probably used the term in relation to your work environment or the learning environment. It's commonly used in relation to workplace EDI learning. Today, I have some ideas to share about how we view safe spaces at Be The Riot. And I also have a few questions for you that will hopefully help you to discover opportunities to increase the safety of learners within your organization. Let's begin with a few questions. And this is all about really sort of recognizing and addressing psychological safety within the work environment, which I'll come on to explaining in just a moment. So here are just four questions for you to consider. Can I ask for help without experiencing negative consequences from my peers? Can I make informal suggestions without experiencing negative consequences from my peers? Can I give challenging feedback? And can I make mistakes or without experiencing negative consequences from my peers? These are four questions that we include within our EDI employee surveys. They're helpful for measuring workplace psychological safety. Before getting into the specifics of creating safe spaces, we have to consider psychological safety and workplace culture. Psychological safety and learning and development are closely linked and a psychologically unsafe environment is, isn't conducive to learning, collaboration or innovation. So hopefully you have some positive responses to those questions. Um, but if not, there are plenty of organisations <clears throat> in which some of these things are a struggle um, and are cultural issues that the organisations themselves are trying to solve. So it's not completely uncommon to, to experience some of these challenges. But let's go back just a bit to understand a little bit more about psychological safety. It's a term that uh, was coined and defined by Harvard Business School professor, um, Amy Edmondson. Some of you will be familiar with her very famous and very viral TED talk. As the four questions highlighted, psychological safety is when employees feel comfortable asking for help, sharing suggestions informally, challenging the status quo, and, and of course, sort of making mistakes as well, um, all without fear of negative social consequences, such as being humiliated or penalized. It's about how comfortable people are with taking risks and being vulnerable with their team. These are the signs of a psychologically safe environment. So learning leads have a responsibility to address these challenges, but shouldn't be expected to do it alone. Let's look at how psychological safety and learning are connected. So number one, asking for help. When people ask for help, they can, of course, get support to do their job better. They can learn, they can become more competent, they can collaborate to fix problems, and overall performance improves. If a person's unable to ask for help, uh, their learning needs become more difficult to identify and knowledge and skills gaps um, could go unaddressed. Making informal suggestions or sharing suggestions informally. When people put forward suggestions, um, this can improve the services being delivered through developing new services or improving, of course, existing current services. It can also be about introducing new ways of working. Um, it can make processes more efficient, ultimately leading to innovation. 
Number three is challenging the status quo. Um, this is also linked to innovation. So every organization um, has its culture, has its traditions, has its systems um, and ways of working in place. Sometimes these are deeply ingrained and if not challenged and adapted, can actually be detrimental to the organization's success going forward. And point four is on making mistakes. So in every working environment, people make mistakes and mistakes are an opportunity for learning. So in a psychologically unsafe environment, people make mistakes and actually try to hide them or don't take ownership of them. This means that opportunities for that learning get lost and in particular opportunities for team learning as well. Um, other people could avoid making the same mistakes if they were aware of, of how, how it happened in the first place. So as learning leads, the environments we try to create typically encompass, encompass aspects of these four things. We want learners to feel like they can ask for help or point out when they don't understand something. We want people to be able to share ideas, share ideas with their peers, with their colleagues. We want people to also challenge themselves um, and challenge others to do things differently in order to get better results and not settle for mediocre performance. We also don't want people to worry about making mistakes, but recognize that this is an important part of the learning process. The learning environment exists in the wider organizational culture. So creating safe spaces um, is conducive to learning or creating spaces that are conducive to learning becomes very difficult when the cultural issues of psychological safety actually aren't being addressed. So a tip for what you can actually do to start measuring psychological safety in your workplace um, is using these four questions um, and including them in employee um, surveys. What you want to do is recognize any gaps or hindrances and factor that into your approach. So for example, to foster a culture where people feel able to challenge the status quo or give challenging feedback, work with others across the organization to provide education and resources about effective ways to give and receive feedback, get managers and leaders proactively sharing personal feedback that they've received and the actions that they're taking to address it. Also, introduce regular opportunities to share feedback in leadership Q&As, team meetings and one-to-ones. And finally, get managers and leaders to proactively seek feedback with patients in a variety of settings and encourage feedback through multiple channels. Now, we'll take a look at equity, diversity and inclusion learning. So, you want to understand the challenge challenges of EDI learning and what can actually make it unsafe. So the purpose of EDI learning, equity, diversity and inclusion learning, is to support people to work more cohesively with their peers. It's also about respecting each other's differences and creating an environment where anyone can thrive, no matter what their background is or no matter how they identify. So it's also about challenging bias and taking a zero tolerance approach to discrimination in line with the UK Equality Act, which outlines the nine protected characteristics. But actually, many organisations go beyond the focus of preventing discrimination to actively encouraging diversity, celebrating differences and creating a sense of workplace belonging. But none of this is actually simple. And here are a few reasons why. Um, and the first is that EDI topics are sensitive in nature. We talk about the issues of gender bias, sexism, racism, ableism, homophobia, and transphobia, and so many other challenging issues. And often we talk about subjects that people aren't used to speaking about with work colleagues, if at all. We also find that people have difficult lived experiences. So someone has been impacted by these issues and that actually makes it very personal. Sometimes the topic brings reminders of previous difficult experiences and trauma. Third reason I wanted to raise is the tense political landscape. So there are and have been several direct attacks on the work of equality and social justice. 
in particular from leading voices such as politicians, um, those with media platforms and the tabloids. And so politicizing issues that actually require adult conversations and creating an atmosphere where people feel very uncomfortable um, to engage. So people often uh, are sort of hesitant or resistant because they don't want to be called out for saying the wrong thing and they don't want to be labeled or put into a box for sharing their thoughts. I'm going to ask another question to get you thinking and it's actually about your own colleagues, your peers, your workforce. On a scale of one to 10, how comfortable is the average person in your organization when it comes to engaging in EDI learning? A recent statistic highlighted that 26% of employees find conversations about EDI frustrating and 22% of employees find them nerve-wracking. And this was according to a 2023 report by The Unmistakable. Now, addressing the frustration, for some, um, this is about not seeing lasting changes to workplace culture and viewing conversations um, about EDI as lip service, right? That person who says, nothing's changed, nothing's going to change, so why bother? Why do I continue to engage? For others, it may be that they feel that they've spoken um, or been spoken to a lot already on this topic or these topics. So that person is thinking, haven't we talked about these issues enough? For this seminar, we won't get into addressing the frustration side, which is really about a successful EDI strategy um, and ensuring that your EDI strategy is making an impact and actually leading to change. But we will talk about addressing the nerves um, and that sort of discomfort and fear that people have. So this is where psychological safety and safe spaces come in. UCLA research found that fear inhibits learning. So our brains perform poorly when we are bombarded with flight or fight chemicals, um, which actually put the fear itself causes um, resources to be diverted away from the parts of the brain that manage working memory and processing new information. And this hinders our analytical thinking, our creative insight and problem solving skills. We can't learn if we don't feel safe. And on that note, another question to get you reflecting is what steps are being taken by your organization to foster a culture of psychological safety? Is this a question that you can answer? Are there clear practices or initiatives in place that aim to directly tackle psychological safety? If the answer to that is no, then this is definitely something that should be raised internally. Another question, um, and actually links to what we'll be looking at next, is what steps are being taken by your organization to foster safe spaces for learning? Hopefully it's clear by now that simply calling something a safe space doesn't actually make it safe. Instead, we should be asking ourselves the question, what steps can I take to make this a safe learning environment? And so that's exactly what we're going to be looking at shortly. So I'll share some of the steps that we typically take at Be The Riot, along with the case studies of some of the organizations we work with. So one is Hawksmoor, a hospitality company with um, just over a thousand employees. And another is a pharmaceutical company whose name I can't share because they are very private, um, but they have around one and a half thousand um, working within their EMEA team. When we think about the learning environment, one of the first things we consider is who's in the room and what's expected of them. Um, and this really is about power dynamics. Um, well, that's one side of it, power dynamics. So we know that in every workplace, there are power dynamics at play. 
we never want this to have a detrimental effect on learning. So we consider carefully who should attend. Despite a manager or leader's best efforts to put others at ease, people are often more vocal when they aren't in the room. With our client Hawksmoor, we discussed the team dynamics. We started with the company's most senior leaders and worked with peer groups for other sessions rather than having people attend alongside their manager. This also works well for leaders because they're also there to learn and that actually should be the expectation. So attending with the teams that they manage can sometimes cause them to feel pressure to have all the right answers um, and not to ask a silly question or not to share openly. Another aspect of this is actually being the only. So employees from underrepresented groups or marginalized backgrounds can feel an extra level of discomfort. For example, if you're the only person of color in a workshop focused on racism. Your colleagues may expect you to speak up. We never want to put an expectation on people to share their personal experiences. Um, these can be traumatic and reliving them can be re-traumatizing. And people who have experiences with racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, etc. aren't necessarily experts on the subjects and shouldn't be expected to provide advice or speak on behalf of a marginalized group. Even if it's made clear that there is no expectation for individuals to share their experiences, being the only one in the room can make for an uncomfortable environment. For, for those that this applies to, you can give them the option to engage with the learning content in other ways. The next point really is a simple one and, and probably quite an obvious one. Recognize where people are in their learning journey. A space might not feel safe if the content feels too advanced. People may lack the confidence to engage if they lack the basic tools to meaningfully take part in the content or struggle to keep up. Another point is to use facilitators who can work sensitively. If there is a facilitator involved in your learning intervention or program, it's important that they're skilled at striking a balance between making people feel comfortable enough to fully participate while also challenging their perspectives when not in line with EDI principles. Confrontational criticism can cause people to shut down, um, become defensive and withdraw from the learning process. Experienced facilitators will use non-confrontational ways to challenge people, get them thinking and keep them engaged in the conversation. So a uh, client that we worked with in the uh, pharmaceutical industry, alongside discussing facilitation styles with them, we also discussed slowing down the pace um, uh, at which the content was being delivered for groups who didn't have English as a first language, we had participants joining from all over Europe. And so this was actually a really crucial point. Um, and we also included more breaks within the content as well to give people a bit of headspace um, and time to reflect on what had already come. The next point is to prepare people for EDI learning. Um, ahead of a learning workshop or event, it can be helpful to prepare people for what to expect. Um, with both Hawksmoor and the pharmaceutical company, we shared pre-workshop reading materials with an email letting participants know what will be covered in the session. This is also an opportunity to provide some introductory learning. So going back to that point around recognizing where people are at in the learning journey. Um, and so it does help to ensure that people have the same sort of base knowledge coming into it. Um, alongside the reading material, there's also a reflective task to get participants thinking more deeply about the topic. Perhaps this reflection means they enter the learning space ready um, with thoughts that they actually want to share. My next point is to set expectations through contracting. So we start each workshop with an exercise to form a contract. This can help set the tone and clear expectations. It might be in the form of an agreement or ground rules. This can be a collaborative process with participants deciding what behaviors are encouraged and what's not acceptable in the session. Ground rules might include allowing each other to speak without any interruption, speaking from your own experience rather than making generalizations and respecting confidentiality, especially where you may have people in the room who choose to share personal experiences. 
Another tip is to look after participant well-being. It's common for participants to experience difficult emotions during EDI workshops, getting angry or potentially bursting into tears. Um, at these moments, it's useful for participants to take a pause. The facilitator can let the group know at the start that anyone who feels uncomfortable can step outside or away from the virtual space. In virtual sessions, this might mean asking everyone to go on mute or turn off their cameras for a few minutes. In person, it might mean leading a breathing exercise or asking everyone to engage in silent reflection or to take a five minute break. Another tip is to establish the organization's values and leadership's stance. People can feel more at ease when it's made very clear what the organization's stance is on equity, diversity, and inclusion. With Hawksmoor, for example, we included extracts from their inclusion statement and quotes from their CEO sharing his thoughts on why EDI is essential to the company and what he expects of all team members. If there are policies or statements saying that staff can be their authentic self and the CEO is also saying that, then this can be enabling for those who might have experienced discrimination in the past. With other organizations, we've also included video messages from leaders within the sessions. Another point to, is to take a zero tolerance approach towards bad behavior. So facilitators should always take a zero tolerance approach to offensive comments or abusive behavior. Anyone being disrespectful should be asked to change their behavior or leave. If multiple participants are not respectful of the sensitivity of the subject, it may be better to end the session. In the time that I've been doing this work, I've only ever needed to do this once or twice. And so those are the tips and tools. There are a couple of common questions as well that I thought it would be worth addressing. One is what if people still feel unsafe, um, which is a very sort of valid question. So as we explored at the beginning, psychological safety is a workplace culture issue and is something that takes commitment over time to address. And so even you know when all of the tips and tools have been applied, um, there still may be people who simply don't feel comfortable engaging, and that's understandable. Another question that comes up is around brave spaces. So some of you might have heard of brave spaces, um, which is a term in some circles that has actually replaced safe spaces. The brave space is less concerned with making people feel comfortable and actually more about challenging people to stretch their comfort zone and be brave. Um, so this is an important balance to strike. As the research shows, people actually need to feel safe in order to be in the right frame of mind to learn. But safety isn't achieved by preventing or avoiding discomfort. It's really, you know, when we think about it, how much do we actually learn when we're in our comfortable space? So Safety is really about creating an environment where it's okay to ask questions, put ideas forward, challenge the status quo, and make mistakes. So in summary, in fostering safe spaces for EDI learning, you really want to begin by recognizing the impact that workplace culture has on learner safety within your organization. If there are cultural challenges, be aware of them. One thing you can do is measure psychological safety and consider the findings when approaching learning interventions. If you know there are specific sticking points, um, like the example I shared earlier, where people aren't necessarily comfortable challenging, giving challenging feedback or challenging the status quo, then there are interventions that can be used to address these cultural challenges outside of creating safe learning spaces. Acknowledge that EDI learning has its unique challenges, um, so it shouldn't really be approached um, in the same way that you might approach a health and safety training or a sales training or something else. Actually, there are sort of many aspects of it that do require a sensitive approach. 
take appropriate steps to foster safe spaces for learning while committing to address workplace culture challenges long term. So you have a variety of different tools and tips I've shared with you today. Hopefully they suit your needs, but there might be other things that other organizations are doing as well that you can look into and explore. Thank you so much for your time today. Hopefully this has been a helpful session for you. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in finding out more about Be The Riot, then you can get in touch at be the riot .com or email us at info at be the riot.